All right, guys, today we're talking about implementing VBT. We're going to take a very simple approach and give you guys some really good ideas. Sometimes it can be overwhelming because you can do almost anything with these um, amazing tools. I was this for strength coaches, personal trainers, physical therapists, um, athletes, you know, any, anybody really. Whoever's using velocity, you're going to learn some things today. So my... Coach Travis Mash, you probably already know me. If you're watching this, you probably do. There's some cool things I've done just to know that I'm not just some dude telling you some stuff. <laughs> Here's what we're trying to do today. Step-by-step -step approach to implementing VBT. Simple ways to apply um, to specific populations. This is a, more of a simple approach and then um, potentially a program. Outline for the lecture today. We're going to input. We're going to talk about inputting the athletes, creating squads, and adding body weight, force velocity profiles, parameters, simple ways to implement. Um, so it's going to be good. In, inputting your athletes. Let me go ahead and tell you the simplest way to do it is get all of your athletes and group them in one way or the other. Like, you know, you can either group them by body weight or position or like you can put um, guys in groups that maybe you have one guy who's a veteran along with some rookies but what you're going to do is you're going to think about like at each station the station being probably a rack and a platform you're going to have your ipads each of these so you're going to think about the people who are going to be working at them and you're going to assign those groups to each of those racks and so you can so it makes things so easy because when you get to a rack and you got like four guys, you know, per rack, let's say, and you have the, those names are already preset on the, um, the gym wear on the app on the iPad. So it makes it so easy. So let's say you have, a, you know, Travis, a Ryan, a Matt, and a Tank. And so one guy goes and you can set it to just automatically uh, switch to the next person and it just uh, makes it so easy. It's effortless. And the best way to do it is to develop those groups on like an Excel sheet, send them to Gymware, and they will implement it for you. It makes it so much easier. Or you can do it, as you can see, like this is the way you can, um, you can like develop your squads and uh, you, can, you can do it yourself. You can go under, if you see up here, let me see, let me get like a pointer, like a laser pointer. If you go up here and you, you know, under, you can, you can look at all your athletes and you can add them right there. This is the squads. You can create the squads. But just think about, like, you know, if you have 100 athletes and you're going to do, like, 20 per group, and you're going to do X amount per rack, you can go ahead and predetermine who's going to be at those racks and let them know that, and it's so much easier. Uh, some ways you can – here's some recommendations. So you can um, – you can do by archetype, which I'm going to explain in just a minute. You can put vets with rookies, or you can do it by position, however you want to do this. So, Running a force velocity profile. It's, um, it's the simplest thing. I, here, I'm giving you this. You can, you know, now you'll know. These are some of the, the um, force velocity profiles that we've run on our own athletes, and these, these are all averages. So these are based on, you know, we have at, here at Lenore Ryan, we have all the way from Olympic hopefuls to uh, really good athletes. So these are not just some kids we pulled out of a uh, extra science class and had them test. These are really pretty good numbers. So you got some parameters for bench and deadlift, parameters for squat, strict press, bent over row. And so all you do is just run them however you want to do it. Like I recommend going 35, 40, all the way up to 100% if you can. And then what you do is you see like where are they doing well and where are they doing poorly. Like if they're hitting 0.3 on their squat at 100%, but yet when they're at 35%, they're at 0.85, that's going to be your strong but slow guy over here. See, strong and slow. If, you know, they're yeah, thirty five percent is like one point four and then you know sixty five is like you know point eight five but then down here they're failing at like they can't even get to like point four. So like that's gonna be your um weak but they're fast. And then if they're just like almost lining up, you know, give or take five percent, 
with these numbers, then that's your powerful person. That's who we're all after. Most of us, that's who we're after. Football, rugby, you know, we want powerful, meaning their uh, power is basically looking at force and velocity together. We want people who are strong and fast, who can, who can create a lot of force at a high rate. So, um, and you can base the groups, uh, can be based on the archetype. So each of your squat racks, you can have the people who are strong and slow going together, we can fast going together, or powerful. And that way you can individualize programming without having it to be such a headache. Um, and I know you can't individualize it per individual exactly, but you can create three archetypes. And then if you're a good strength coach, you know how to make a strong and slow person faster, or a weak and fast person stronger. So there's my suggestions. Parameters. Now, at Gym Aware, we have so many parameters. You know, as you can see, we have the uh, concentric mean power, velocity, uh, peak power. Uh, we have, if you uh, subscribe to our uh, cloud, then you're going to get all of these different ones. You know, if you just have the, the um, flex, it's awesome, but you're only going to get, well, they just added a, new, a lot of new features, so they have the eccentric um, parameters as well. But... Uh, they're not going to have the rate of force development, uh, the reactive strength index. Uh, you're not going to get your time to peak force or time to peak power. And like, let me tell you some of the ones that are important. Uh, number one, rate of force development, in my opinion, is the fastest or is the most important or time to peak force or time to peak power. And here's why. You can get your athletes where they're able to create a lot of power. However, if that time it takes them to get to that peak power. If the peak power goes up, but the time also increases, you haven't done a lot because you got to think about how much time you have to create peak power in on a field or like like a baseball player. You know, it's not even a second. It's like point three or point, not even. You know, when your foot strikes the ground, how much time do you have to create peak force to you know to drive your body down the track in a sprint? Not much. So it's important that the time it takes us to reach these awesome numbers, peak force, peak power, those are either going to be staying the same or getting better. Because if we get to where we're creating more force than we've ever, but it takes us longer, nothing's, we don't have that much time on the field of play. So consider that. But then, of course, just you know, understanding the, if you want eccentric overload, then you need to know, for example, like what was the peak power concentrically versus the eccentric uh, peak power that create, you know, which you know, or velocity. And we have eccentric uh, peak and mean power, force, acceleration. Not all; they're not on there just simply because I couldn't fit them all. But you can look at the comparisons of each, and it's super important because, like, if you go through a phase of you know of, of like the triphasic training, and you're really focusing on eccentric overload. You need to know, are you? You know, how do you know that you're overloading the eccentric phase contraction? So you got to look at your concentric compared to your eccentric. So these are just ways to know if what you're doing is working, because you're either going to be measuring guys or you're going to be guessing. So I've given you now, Jim Ware, not me, has given you lots of parameters, and I've told you the important ones, and you guys are all smart you can like figure out your own ways to use these things. The reactive strength index is important. Uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that the gym wear is probably the best way to measure it because you can get ground contact time and height. And the reason why I like it is because it's easier to standardize. So I'll have to make a video on the way that we are doing our RSI scores and the way that we're actually setting up the, the, the measurement. I'll do that next because it's just, you know, otherwise I feel like athletes always find good ways to cheat. And since, you know, with the way that I'm going to show you how we're setting up the reactive strength, it's a depth, a reactive strength index for all that don't know. It's a depth jump. And so what you're doing is you're dividing the height, divided by the ground contact time, and you get a score. And so a lot of times if you're using a map, people have found ways to cheat that. So this is, I'm going to show you a cool way to use the gym warrior to not cheat that. Anyway. A lot of good information. The parameters I can get lost in for days, so I'm going to move on. Simple uses. Here's a very, I, I made this when I went to Sorenex at Summer Strong. 
It's a very simple way to program. You just, week one, you, you, you create a minimum velocity threshold. So you're only allowed to go to 0. 0.6. So you're going to work up to a 5RM. It's going to, you know, and we're talking about the initial one or two reps. And once you get to a 5RM with the first couple of reps is 0. 0.6, that's where you're going to stay. Then you're going to, um, it, normally it's around 77%. You're going to subtract 10% and you're going to do two more sets of five. So it's just a great way to make sure that your athletes are getting nowhere near, you know, too heavy of a weight too soon. So when you, like we all know when your athletes come back, come home out, or come out of like, for example, what just happened in Rockwall, Texas, these kids just come off of Christmas break. And, you know, they, they probably didn't work out. They probably ate a bunch of turkey and candy and now they're out of shape. So instead of throwing them into the wolves and getting them hurt, you say, okay, in week one, we're going to do a 5RM, but only at 0.6 meters per second. Only around 77%. Nowhere near a potential miss. And then um, subtract 10% and do two more sets where you're focusing on um, maximal velocity. Super easy. I've got it to where it's a 5RM. Um, then it goes to 3RM in week five. Same thing, 0 0.5, 0 0.46. 0 um, then we're going to deload. Then we're in the 3RM where the first couple reps is 0.42, somewhere around 89%. No, none of this is going to be even or near where they might miss. As long as they're doing it right, then you're going to be set. So here's the bench deadlift. There's your free, free workout. Uh, there's also easy ways to, to use the, the VBT to progress your athletes. And this is just a picture, but like if you want, email me at Travis at gymwarrior.com and I will send you this little Excel sheet. And what you do is you can, uh, like for squat example, for example, have them um, hit their 60%, uh, make note of the load, the 70, the 80, the 90. If you have gymwear already, you're already gonna have, these are auto automatically tracked for you. And then, uh, so will the load be, but if you don't, write them in and then write the velocities. And I will, this, this thing will automatically estimate what the potential 1RM is here. So here was 341. And that way you can like monitor progressions without having to actually worry about maxing out. You know, you did go 90%, so it's pretty hard, but nowhere near where you might fail. And if you're in season, uh, what's important? You maxing out and seeing if your squat's going up or making sure that you're ready for your sport and just making sure that you're getting stronger. That's all you need to know. Am I progressing? Am I regressing? What's happening? So this is a quick and easy way to uh, do a test without coming close to, to missing. And, you know, and like some people will say, well, I'll just do a heavy 3RM. That's just as dangerous. Bro, a heavy 3RM is like about, if you do a true max 3RM, it's around 92%. So personally, I'd rather do a 1RM at 100% than a 3RM at 92%. We all know because we're getting more fatigued, that third rep is going to be ugly. And it gets ugly so quick, quick, I don't even have time to react. So... I would go with using velocity to guesstimate what's happening. Uh, oh, daily readiness. Too. I'll just let me give you some ideas. On daily readiness, you can either use an RSI score, which is a depth jump. So uh, I'll have to make this video for you. But the gym aware, there's plenty of videos online. But I'm going to show you the way that we're doing it. But you want to look at ground contact time and height and track it over time. You can do the same for counter movement jump. Once again, you can use the gym wear um, or a trap bar jump. All you got to do is make sure you standardize things. I recommend taking the hands out of the equation, either put them behind your head, on your hips, whatever, because, you know, arms can really throw it off because if you hit it, things perfectly, you're going to get an extra inch or two. If you mess that timing up, you know, it's going to mess you up. So we're looking to see, you know, the CNS and the peripheral nervous system how is this athlete, how are they fatigued because of things outside the gym? This is a way of knowing. Now, here's what we do. If our athletes are like greater than 10% slower than normal or their RSI score is 10% less than normal or their counter movement jump is 10% uh, um, less height than normal, trap bar jump is 10% slower than normal, we're going to give them the day off because that's a big, you know, that's a massive decrease. If they're between um, zero and five percent, nothing happens. Now, if they're between five and ten percent, they're fatigued. 
but that's probably what I wanted. It just means maybe we did a little bit of overreaching. So what I'll do is decrease uh, in, uh, intensity and or um, total load, total volume that day, and stay. They'll stay. They'll just decrease things about 20% on the load and the volume. Now let's go to leaderboard and give an immediate feedback. So the leaderboard, this is just a way you can sign your team up and then what happens is that you can stream it to where the the scores that you're, the lifts that the, the kids are making, they all go to one big screen and athletes can compare themselves. Um, one of the, the, one of the most fun ways to do that would be to to use like um what is it power per kilograms of body weight so it's kind of like pound for pound you know who's doing the best that day so i think matter of fact this is probably you know, here, here they did a counter movement jump and uh they did it based on what's the parameter i guess Oh, I guess now they're doing on previous records, so percent of previous record. So this guy went up 13%. So that's a great way to you know equalize it. But if they're doing a weight, you can do it based on who's creating the most power per kilograms of body weight. So it makes it, obviously, if, if a 300-pound lineman's in there with a kicker, like, you know, the 300-pound guy's going to lift the most weight. But if you're looking at pounds per kilogram, now it's pound for pound. So now let me, here we go. So now, immediate feedback. You cannot underestimate the importance of getting immediate feedback, either a ding or a you know, the turning red and getting the, the, the not the ding. And so it just encourages, you, you know, you can lift 80% for five reps or you can lift 80% for five reps as hard as you possibly can. There's a big difference. It's, you know, it's the same load, but that velocity changes everything. You know, when I'm doing maximal intent, you can ensure that compensatory acceleration is happening. And all those great adaptations that Fred Outfit uh, talked about are happening. But only when you're getting, you know, the athlete is actually seeing, am I hitting that number or am I not? But Because if you tell me just to do 80% for five reps, I'm just going to do it. You know, I don't care how fast it's going. But, like, if I'm telling my athletes I want you to push as fast as you can, it needs to be above 0.45, then I can ensure that they're going to do exactly that. And the adaptations are going to be much greater. And so they're going to learn to create force at a much higher rate. Now we're looking at rate of force development improving. So anyway, I think uh, that is it. That's some of the references I use, but thanks for joining us. I hope this helps. And we're going to do a whole lot more on implementation because what the greatest amount of feedback that I've had at the conferences I've been at lately is like, I have all this velocity uh, equipment. I just don't know how to, where to even start. Well, I just gave you some ideas, but we're going to get much deeper on this in the coming months.